Uh, I'm doing it for recording purposes. I'm sure my voice is loud enough to uh, be heard at the rear, but uh, they've asked me to use the mic. Uh, I have the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants. We have in the audience here Bob Waldy, who will be speaking after me. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because I was inspired by a company called Stallion many years ago. And I know I'm embarrassing Bob by sharing the story, but um, uh, I do want to pay tributes to those who have come before me and who continue to do great work for Brisbane. I am going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the economic advantages uh, that I think uh, Brisbane has uh, and some of the opportunities that I think those who are motivated and willing to participate in the open source community can get some economic benefit out of. So there is ways to make money out of open source software. Red Hat obviously is a good example of that. Um, so uh, I'm going to do one slide about Red Hat for those of you who don't know, uh, just to set some context about uh, the company that I'll be talking about and their Brisbane operations. A lot of you will have seen the brief that I had provided Martin, and thank you for the introduction, Martin, uh, is you know, why is Red Hat in Brisbane? Why are we here? And I'm going to answer that story by talking about some of the demand. Uh, this is the business track of open source software, so I'm going to use that supply demand analysis. And I'm going to talk about some of the demand for open source and some of the skills and services that are associated with open source, and then talk about how Red Hat chose Brisbane to be able to supply some of those, uh, meet, you know, to meet some of that demand. So Red Hat as a company, and this is the only corporate slide, was founded in 1993, IPO in 1999. 66 offices in 30 countries, revenues in excess of 700 million US dollars last year. Uh, that's our goal to be a $1 billion company um, by the end of our next financial year. So it's certainly been a, a very successful company, but a very hard place to work for the, uh, just have my 10th anniversary for all of those who, um, all the Red Hatters in the audience, they're all uh, 10 years at Red Hat last year. And it's been a wild ride. Certainly when I joined, uh, the company has, been, has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And through telling the story of uh, Red Hat in Brisbane, I think you'll see how we've evolved as well to, uh, to meet the demand for Red Hat's services. An upside to the downturn. So this is a presentation that I gave to uh, Linux Conference back in 2002, uh, when Red Hat was uh, only just started. So I wanted to try and use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that the global financial crisis has been a uh, challenge for many economically. Most of the small businesses that we know, uh, you know that, that we have relationships with in Brisbane have been going through hard times. In my role, I travel through India, China, and the Czech Republic. And you know, globally, I've seen the impact of the global financial crisis. Uh, the difficulty it's been to, um, you know, for companies to grow in these, in these economic times. So my objective here is to give you a bit of a background of why I think some demand is going to continue and why uh, I think we continue to have an opportunity to uh, build thriving businesses around open source software. And that's because of the demand for it. Going back to 2002 when I first presented this, a lot of the content hasn't changed and that surprised me in preparing for this talk. I did anticipate that things would happen much faster. So 10 years ago when I was you know, uh, a little younger, a little naive and uh, getting excited about joining Red Hat and the opportunity that open source had, uh, it took a long time to achieve some of these objectives. But we can see here one of the main reasons that I think there will continue to be economic opportunities around open source and that's because of the demand for open source in Asia. And it's driven, driven let's, you know, the, it's, it's touch and go whether Japan or China are the world's second largest economy. They're either second or third, depending on where you are and uh, when you do that numbers. So we've got two of the largest world economies in Asia. And we're in the same time zone and we have a lot of skill sets associated with Asia. Increasing deployment of open source software. Uh, many of you, if you've followed open source deployments throughout Asia, will have heard of Red Flag. You may have heard of um, Hancom. You may have heard of Miracle. There's a large number of uh, uh, Linux distributions that have grown up in China, Japan, and Korea. And they occurred because of the demand for Linux. Uh, India has is is, uh, recently joined the Free Software Foundation. Uh, one of the most exciting projects that I've seen happening in India recently is their national ID project, the unique ID project of India, uh, where they intend to issue an identity card 
to every citizen of India. The purposes are primarily to reduce fraud. So there's a lot of people claiming benefits and they believe that if they can get rid of at least one or two percent of those fraudulent cases, they could fund the program completely. The code for that project is developed as an open source project. Literally, it's a government run project uh, and it's all done in an open source fashion, predominantly with open source software. So in terms of uh, not just the economic benefits, the lower cost, you know, the total cost of ownership being better with Linux, open source giving you, you know, freeing you from vendor lock-in. It's reached to a point where governments are now not only embracing those value propositions, but also embracing the way that the software is developed. So the government projects are being run under an open source model. I think it's a really important example of a tipping point that we see in major governments throughout Asia. And let's face it, major governments in Asia have got a lot of money. So that's where we see the economic opportunity continues to grow. So the open source advantage in Asia is input method technology. Uh, Red Hat in Brisbane has been developing input method technology and we've now worked with our offices in China to uh, implement IBUS. It's the reference implementation for the CJK Northeast Asia Open Source Software Symposium. There's a collaborative China, Japanese and Korean government effort to coordinate in seven different layers. One of those is on input method technologies. It's a very important part of the industry throughout Asia. Uh, most of you appear to be speaking and uh, hopefully familiar with English and are familiar with using English um, uh, entries uh, for character entry. For Asian languages, it's ex it can be a very complex and at times a very expensive exercise to get input methods that are available to you in your language. Chinese has, uh, well, mainland Chinese has over 28,000 characters in their GB18030 standard. And to pick one of those 28,000 characters requires very complex software. Traditionally, that's been an industry um, locked up by proprietary input methods. But recently, they've moved and the uh, Northeast Asia Open Source Software Symposium, uh, co a conglomerate of the three governments, have agreed to adopt IBUS as a reference implementation. And that's completely open source and primarily developed by Red Hat. So it's a real game changer for those who have to use uh, Asian language technologies. There's also, as I'm sure you will have seen, if anyone's following Slashdot or recent news, there is, um, and uh, the venerable Jeff Houston is doing a keynote, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Jeff Houston speaking tomorrow? Or Wednesday, is it? Um, strongly recommend you go see Jeff. He's a good friend of mine. He wrote the OECD paper on the depletion of IPv4 and the necessary need to migrate to IPv6. IPv6 has been around for almost 15 years. A lot of the standards development and certainly a lot of the early implementations were done by Japanese vendors. So there's a lot of technology and uh, to some extent a, there's both a supply of IPv6 skills in Asia and a high demand for <coughs> IPv6 skills in Asia. So APNIC, the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre where I worked previously, uh, is about to make a request for a slash eight in the next couple of weeks. And when that happens, that will trigger the other registries uh, getting their slash eights as well. And that will mark the end of available IPv4 address space. So these sort of tipping points are gonna continue to happen. And I think Asia has a, has a potential economic advantage by having been, um, you know, being, uh, been forced to use V6 earlier than others, but also by having been involved in its development earlier on. And obviously a lot of Asian language technology is developed here locally. So I'll talk specifically about China, Japan and Korea where this demand is coming from. Uh, we see that the Chinese government wants to comply with software um, copyright and you know, the safe use of software. So they've been investing in uh, local Linux companies They've been encouraging Linux and open source software for government procurement since 2002. Red Flag is a very famous Chinese distribution. There are many others. Uh, there's probably three or four famous ones just in Hong Kong alone. So there's a lot of opportunity for Linux distributions to meet local demand. And as the market has matured, it's gone beyond just the Linux distributions into middleware stacks, programming languages, other opportunities, training and input methods that I mentioned earlier. So that's not going to change. This is part of the Chinese government push to get away from pirated software. 
They want to get to open source because it solves that problem for them. Japan, as I mentioned earlier, uh, were, the lead, were some of the leading developers of IPv6. Certainly NEC and their, their implementations on routers was, was uh, very early on. And uh, as a country, they have had a strong push for open source software in education and in government. So uh, they've been doing this from probably about 2003, 2004, where they've had research into the adoption of open source software for education sectors. So again, government demand for open source software. And for all of you who may have contributed to open source software in the past, it's an economic opportunity, either in uh, countries that, either in these countries specifically or to provide services to these countries as they continue to adopt open source software. Korea is probably one of the most famous for the use of Linux and embedded devices. Mizzy Linux, uh, the early use of um, Linux for embedded uh, has been uh, very prevalent. And at one point in 2006, 2007, I think there were over 30 Linux handsets. So we can go back four years. Everybody's heard of Android now, but we can go back four or five years and we can see just as prevalent Linux adoption on embedded devices in Korea. So they were certainly ahead of the curve in terms of um, adopting Linux from embedded devices. Government procurement, there's uh, even an initiative inside of Korea to do a Korean distribution. You will have seen in the press recently talk of Russia creating a Russian Linux distribution. This nationalization of Linux I'm not so sure I agree that that's the right approach. Um, it does have a bit of a fork uh, mentality to it, so I think there would be issues over time uh, with countries that have tried to create their country-specific distribution. I think that, that kind of misses the point of it being a communal global effort. But it does show that they're trying to embrace open source and they're trying to make it their own, and that creates an opportunity to meet that demand. Governments want to get to have the ability to read the code, you know, the ability, all of the advantages that you probably have felt by using open source in the past. So to summarise, uh, strong government support and government hold a lot of money, particularly in uh, China, Japan and Korea. So that's going to give us an opportunity for developing nations to break out of piracy. A lot of the uh, developing nations, ASEAN nations, don't want to do software piracy. They would just want to get their job done with computers and open source gives them that ability to do so. They've been, Asia has been a leading technology provider and implementer for uh, in some of these emerging technologies, IPv6 as I mentioned earlier, and there's a lot, lot lower barrier to entry. There's no sort of intellectual property barriers to the adoption or understanding open source software. So it makes it much easier for them to embrace it. Okay, so hopefully I've left you all with a demand. And now we're going to talk about how Red Hat in Brisbane has grown to meet that demand. Um, indirectly and directly. So I have the pleasure of running our operations in India and China, so they report up to me. So it's not a combative relationship. The success of Red Hat worldwide has meant that we have grown operations in China and India, but it's also helped Red Hat in Brisbane to grow. So we've grown together as opposed to having to lose jobs to India or China. And I think we can sustain a competitive advantage in the Queensland or the Australian economy uh, because of some key points here. First one being economic. You may be surprised to see that I would um, uh, be willing to put up a slide saying that Australia's got some economic advantages, but it does. One of the things that you learn as you start to budget and plan for staff across the globe is that wild fluctuations in exchange rates or cost of livings can make your budgeting and planning exercises very difficult. Australia has had a great track track record, a very predictable, stable economy. Um, my personal belief is that uh, a lot of that's based on the fact that we're the world's largest exporter of coking coal. Um, and one of the reasons I'm you know, participating in an event like this is because I think we can't remain dependent on exporting coal uh, around the world. We need to become a services economy at some point. And I think we have great opportunity to be exporting services, which I'll talk through here. But that has made a big difference to Red Hat's ability to plan and to execute uh, comfortably in Australia because it is very easy to predict. It's a very stable economy. Culturally, and I know this, again, probably would go without saying, but the Australia as a multicultural society 
has federal government, state government, local government support. Uh, and QUT, is, uh, the university that we're in now, is a great example of the impact of that. So we've had federal legislation for multiculturalism since the 80s, um, state legislation after that. And what it's meant is that we're a great exporter of education. Over 30% of the IT graduates coming from QUT are from outside Australia. So I have, a, as, a, as a business operator, I've got a regular supply of graduates with language skills and IT degrees willing and interested in living in this country. And that's a real advantage. That's an economic and a cultural advantage that not many other places in the world can have, where we're able to get all of these multicultural um, people from Europe, people from Asia, not just willing to, to um, study in Australia, but also willing to, st to stay and work in Australia. And that's an advantage that not many other countries in the world have. Information technology and innovation. So the Queensland Government uh, has had the Smart State Initiative. For those of you who are outside of uh, Queensland or Australia, you will see the occasional Smart State um, on our uh, licence plates. There's an uh, Australian tall poppy backlash to that. We're not very comfortable calling ourselves a, a smart state. Uh, but I'm one of those people that says, you know, I'm on the side of the coin that if you uh, keep saying it and keep delivering it, eventually it'll come true. So I want us to be a smart state. I don't want us to be a, uh, a coal exporter for the rest of our lives. And I think we can add higher value to the world. And one of the ways that we can do that is by having a stable economy and a great supply of IT skilled language, you know, multilingual people. Best current practice, Red Hat's not the only company that has identified the opportunity that uh, Queensland presents. Uh, there are a lot of other companies that have chosen to set up headquarters here or have um, grown large operations here. Boeing has its Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific headquarters here. Oracle has a, a large development team here. Stellar are a very large call centre operator down on the Gold Coast. And Citibank also do their call centre work from here. I pick our call centre, but that's um, mostly because of the brand names here. But there are a lot of other very successful software companies based in Brisbane. So I'm now going to move on to the what does Red Hat do in Brisbane part. And the objective of the background here was to show that there's a demand. Asia is going to continue to demand skills in open source. That may be training, that may be uh, input method technology, it may be uh, operating systems providers, it may be middleware providers. There's a demand for those open source services in Asia and it's going to continue to grow. And Brisbane has a, an advantage, has an economic advantage and that's a stable economy. We have a ready supply of multilingual IT skilled um, graduates and the Red Hat's been able to uh, capitalise on that as some of the other companies that I mentioned as well. So uh, Red Hat began in November 1999 as a sales and marketing operation. Uh, we were located on James Street in the valley, uh, one of the areas probably recently affected by flooding. And uh, we were in a small townhouse, um, you know, only a handful of staff I joined, I think, as about employee number four in 2001. No worries, yet. I'm probably going too fast anyway, so it gives me a chance to slow down. Okay, and at the time, we, uh, the operations were started under the brief of being the regional headquarters for sales and marketing. So Red Hat was beginning to get demand, uh, certainly in Japan, being one of our most mature markets from a very early stage. They wanted to be able to get access to Red Hat, and at the time, it was a small North Carolina company. They picked Brisbane as their headquarters uh, for a couple of reasons. I wasn't with the company at the time, but one of the reasons that... Um, we shared, because I also relocated the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre from Tokyo to Brisbane, was because of a KPMG report that was published at, at around this period of time. And KPMG did a study of the cost of operations throughout Asia, and what they found was, and they still do maintain this report, is generally focusing on off-capital cities. So if you're in Sydney, price of real estate, average salaries, 
you know, the cost of living, generally higher. So Brisbane has got economic advantage in all, all those three areas. So a KPMG um, study showed that IT skills were, were um, there was a good supply of IT skills. Brisbane had an economic advantage over Sydney and Melbourne in terms of cost of operations. And so as a location from which to grow their Asia Pacific base, Red Hat picked Brisbane, as did I when I was relocating APNIC from out of Tokyo. Uh, in 2001, we realised, uh, I joined the company, uh, we were getting a lot of Japanese people calling Raleigh, North Carolina, trying to speak Japanese, and uh, they were having trouble filling that language skills from, from the east coast of the US. So uh, we offered to provide that technical support, and it began. So the operations outside of a sales and marketing activity began in Brisbane by providing Japanese technical support. And that's continued to right through to today where, ironically, it's not so much our, our Asian language skills, which has been the greatest asset of the technical support team in Australia. It's been the uh, Australian attitude and how much it's appreciated by the West Coast of the United States. So we have a large segment of our customer base who will wait for the support, English support, to roll around to Australia because they've built friendships with the Australian support team. So we do a lot of support, obviously, for companies in Australia, New Zealand, and any English-speaking ASEAN countries, and we also do the after hours follow the Sun Support Centre work for, for the United States. And to this day, Red Hat remains one, um, Red Hat and Brisbane is one of the five um, follow the Sun Support Centres for, for, um, for Red Hat. Uh, I joined in 2001 with the mandate to do a uh, Asian products. So we were a much smaller company back then, about 400 staff. We're just over 4,000 now, I think. We're approaching 4,000. So you know, we're 10 times bigger now than when I joined the company back then. And uh, we were given carte blanche. We were free to do our own distribution. Uh, so we did. We literally made, we forked off of uh, the mothership and made our own Japanese, Chinese, and Korean versions. And then over time, slowly worked that skill set back into the company as um, the global demand for for internationalisation continued. But this is where uh, the research and development activities that came out of Brisbane began, was with um, being given the mandate to do a uh, Chinese, Japanese and Korean version of our product. So uh, like most startups, we outsourced most things in the beginning and internationalisation wasn't something that we could outsource. There was no um, anyone who was around during the Unix wars will have remembered that internationalisation and particularly input method technology was quite broken at the end of the Unix wars. Um, we only had the X-input architecture and you know, if you wanted to switch languages you had to log out of your desktop and log back in again. Um, so there was a lot of research that needed to happen just in terms of core rendering and uh, rendering input and print and display technology that um, was brave new world. Nobody had ever done it before. We certainly couldn't copy it from Unix because it, it kind of stopped halfway through. But uh, for 2001, we used third parties, so we used translation companies. What we identified early on was that um, most of the large translation companies worldwide were very familiar with the lingua franca of Windows and Microsoft. And so when we tried to use them for localization of open source software, it's a different vocabulary, it's a different language. Uh, they didn't do a good job of it. So we chose to bring that in-house, uh, primarily to have that ability to educate a set of staff on the language of open source. It's gone on to mean a lot more to us than just the ability to deliver good translations. So it's specifically called localization because we've found that investing in people who's native language skills um, are their primary asset but have an IT background, that there's lots of tertiary benefits. And the way the translation industry is structured today, you rarely get to use that advantage. So if you've got a dedicated a Japanese associate who's part of the Red Hat brand and they're translating a piece of collateral, they're going to have a very different attachment to the material than somebody who's in a third party translation company. So they, they, they're invested in the material that they're doing. The other advantage, given that we're co-located with internationalization, is that we can use them to test our software. So to do a Japanese translation, you have to have a Japanese input method. And we're, we're producing the input method technology here in Brisbane. So there was a, a proximity advantage by co-locating internationalization and localization. 
A third advantage occurred later when we started to do quality engineering. So that, that one localization person you know, hired as a translator now has become a quality engineer, has become a user interface tester, and, has, and also continues in that role of translation. The most important advantage that I think has occurred for Red Hat and what has made us sustainable here is that we acknowledge that we're part of a community. So all of the Japanese, all of the translators that Red Hat have, have a mandate and a responsibility to be part of their local language community. So you know, translators for uh, Japanese, Korean and Chinese have been with Red Hat for almost 10 years, as long as I have, and many of them are community leaders in the Fedora project, or the Mozilla translation for Chinese, or the GNOME uh, Korean translations. They're done by Red Hatters, and they have that dual responsibility of corporate, you know, corporate performance, but also community contribution. And that's made it very sustainable for us. They're, they're very high, um, yeah, they're associates, but they're also very high value for us because they can influence the adoption of technology, they can influence the, the quality of the translation before it even becomes a product. And there's a lot of tertiary benefit there that those from a traditional proprietary software ship off your message strings, get your translated strings back, ship the product. They miss out on all of that, the, the feedback loop of being part of a community. 2004, we took on product management. Uh, this is when Red Hat was going to be a box product company. We were selling T-shirts, mugs, and uh, pocketbooks. And uh, so we took on that responsibility. Asia was um, still, to this day, suffers from uh, lack of ubiquitous bandwidth. And that's probably one of the most common conversations I have with my European and American counterparts is that downloading this DVD, it's going to be cheaper for me for you to ship it to me in the post than for me to expend, uh, expend all of my bandwidth trying to download it. So uh, a lot of folks don't realize that bandwidth in Asia is a, still a precious commodity and it's very expensive. So we had a large demand for, um, for pocketbooks just as a way to distribute Linux as interest in open source started to grow through Asia. So we took on product management. We also consolidated European language translations here. Uh, so since 2004, we've been doing all of the European work for, um, for Red Hat from here. Uh, customer service, so then uh, Red Hat's beginning to, in Brisbane, begins to get uh, an internal brand, and in, an internal recognition, and uh, the language skills that we're able to provide, the product engineering group uh, become, and the technical support group become of interest to other parts of the company, and the customer service, so those not related to technical support, begin their operations and continue to do their operations for Asian language support from here. Uh, product management gets crossed out because we no longer do box product. We don't, uh, we don't do retail anymore. Quality engineering, I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the proximity advantage of having the internationalization engineers in proximity with the localization uh, services providers coupled with quality engineering. And we can see that we're able to do desktop testing, not just in English, but in all of the 23 languages that Red Hat now support from a single location. For those of you who do large-scale software development, what you will encounter is that localization, internationalization, all of those sort of activities are right, right at the end. You know, they're the tail of the dog. No matter how good your program management or um, you know, your formal software development lifecycle may be, it inevitably comes to some, oh, there's a patch that needs to go in, I've got to break string freeze, uh, can translation catch up, and can we still keep to the ship date? So anyone who's faced that sort of commercial pressure of delivering software realise that these are very much tail activities. You know, the last things that people think of when they're making a code change. And by having all of us um, related to localization, internationalization, and the testing of it co-located, it gives us very rapid response. So we're not going to translation vendors all around the world trying to coordinate getting at, you know, translations in on time within 24 hours. So often what happens at Red Hat is that there'll be a string freeze, then an engineer will break it, it's a major UI component, we need to get it fixed, we can't ship the product without it, and within 24 hours we can turn it around. So the US shut down, Australia turns on, we can translate it into all those languages, we can verify that it fits within the UI, we can test it, we can commit the code changes back, and by the next morning, the US have got working software in all the languages. So we're one of the few companies that is capable of what in the industry is called SimShip, 
we can simultaneously ship all languages at the same time. Uh, Oracle has done a pretty good track record of that as well, and Microsoft unf uh, unfortunately hasn't had a good track record there. It's a major tactical advantage if you're producing large volumes of software to be able to sim ship, because you're only ever having to wonder, worry about one master. You're not having to worry about, oh, did I patch the Korean version? Did the Japanese version get patched? You don't have to worry about that when you're a sim ship company, and it's a real tactical advantage for Red Hat. So not only is the fact that we're in Asia an advantage, the fact that we're off time zone, we've capitalised on that advantage as well. Uh, other long-running activities, you know, IPv6, it's a hell of a lot easier for me to get an IPv6 engineer here in Australia or in Asia than it is in the United States. There's just not the demand for it. Or if there is an IPv6 engineer in the US, they're very expensive because you know, Department of Defense have already started to soak them all up. Where IPv6 here has been common for a long time. You know, APNIC was one of the first registries to start issuing IPv6 address space and then certainly for the next 10 years it's going to be the largest distributor of IPv6 in the world. Uh, open IETNAN, Open Internationalization Standards, Linux Standards Based Certification, the Chinese government GB18030, which is a physical test. It's not just a rubber stamp. You do literally have your operating system installed and they will randomly pick any one of their 28,000 characters and they'll tell you how do I put in that character and make sure it comes out on that printer. It's a real test. And uh, I'm very proud to say that we were the first non-Chinese company to achieve A-plus certification for our operating system as a direct re result of two engineers here in Brisbane. Um, and it was a, you know, a pretty gruelling start, but uh, it's something we've been able to achieve ever since. So um, I'll keep moving on. Uh, for the Red Hatters in the audience, some of the uh, timelines, it may not have been exactly 2007, so for dramatic effect, I've aligned certain activities to, uh, to annual boundaries. Uh, content services was the next one that we, uh, that we chose to bring to Australia. So Australia's got a great um, uh, hidden ability to produce good content. Uh, there's lots of technical authors here in Queensland and many of them are of very high calibre. So once we realise there's an advantage in keeping internationalisation and localisation in the same time zone, we thought, well, what if the English content was also produced in time zone so that the, uh, you know, the English writer couldn't escape the wrath of 23 people who just had to translate their bad sentence? So uh, <laughs> believe me, it works. Um, so we've moved uh, content services to Brisbane and we're now um, from our operations here maintaining over 2,500 manuals, technical manuals, are built, written, distributed and translated from the Brisbane office. So what we've done internally is try to identify where the benefits of time zone and proximity have added value and where we've got a skill set to meet that demand and focused on those areas of contribution. Um, and you can see how we're continuing through here. Once we had this many people, so we're somewhere between 100 and 140 staff in Brisbane. Uh, we're over 200 uh, throughout Australia with operations in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, we needed to have uh, support. We're up to over, just under 200 staff in China, about 100 in India. So we needed to have, as you can imagine, with 400 engineers in this time zone, writing code, producing material, they needed a lot of operational support. So engineering operations was established in Brisbane and we're the, one of the support centres for the internal engineering group. There's some great examples here of where that, um, and I don't normally do the Australiana thing by the way, I, I speak internationally, but assuming that we're in Brisbane, there's a Brisbane audience. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the strengths of uh, the Australian attitude. And it's that get in and do it, get your hands dirty. I'm, I could say that about the India, China and the Czech Republic, of course, as well. Uh, but that get in and get things done attitude has been a real advantage for us. And you can see this with uh, some other Brisbane companies that have come through the incubator, the iHub I incubator at Tawong. Uh, a company called CVS Dude, later renamed to Codesian. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, great Brisbane startup, recently acquired. Uh, did basically what engineering operations do. They run uh, version control systems, bug tracking systems, the nuts and bolts, the almost systems administration for engineers. Uh, and Mark Baffy started that, uh, that operation in Tuong and, and has been a very successful company. So we did basically the same thing. So although I'm talking about Red Hat internally as a customer, 
all of these proof points I can give you Brisbane startups who've done basically the same thing to a, to a commercial audience. So where we took on engineering operations, we got CVS dude, now named Codesian, doing basically the same, same activity because of the skill sets that are available here and the off hours, the off hours advantage with the US. By 2009, uh, our contributions to input method technology have now gone upstream. We're world leaders, uh, and the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean governments have adopted our reference implementation for input method technologies. That's had a lot of impact on Red Hat in terms of our GNOME development team, and in particular with our X11 core graphics team. So uh, a couple of esteemed Red Hat colleagues will be presenting. David Ailey is one of them. Um, anyone who's seen the mode setting move into the kernel uh, will be familiar with Dave's work, and he's based here in Brisbane. And once you get somebody of that calibre in your organisation, they can attract other talent as well. So we've started to build our core X11 team here in Brisbane as well. Finally, by 2010, we get some back office support. <clears throat> uh, we finally get some recruiting and finance showing up, which is making our life a lot easier. Uh, but it shows that we've, kind of, we've come full circle. We originally started as a sales and marketing headquarters. At some point along the line, that moved to Singapore and quite happy to keep sales and marketing out of my engineering facilities. Uh, but now we've come full circle and we're back to a real operation where we have um, you know, finance and HR and all those other sort of supporting services based out of Brisbane. So is there an upside to the economic downturn? I believe there is. Uh, and it's based on being able to find ways to capitalise on the advantages that you have. You know, I work with um, you know, hundreds of engineers in the Czech Republic, India and China, and are constantly are talking about what skill sets does this geography, this time zone, bring. You know, the, the great thing about open source is you get contributors everywhere. You know, we find kernel developers in Beijing who have been writing device drivers for mobile phones for four years. They're incredible. You just, wow, you know, where were you? Why didn't we know about you? Uh, India and their contributions to fonts and to Unicode standards, uh, really world leading in terms of their ability to influence international design. Uh, the Czech Republic, you know, long-term contributors to the Linux kernel, you go back to the early 90s to the mid-90s, you'll see a lot of Czech um, contributors to the Linux kernel. So a broad understanding of open source software occurs everywhere in the world. India, China and the Czech Republic, uh, so India, China and you know, other countries in Asia are yet to cross that tipping point. We don't see them making a lot of upstream contributions. They're kind of taking open source and, and internalizing it and making a value to them and their economies. But the tipping point will come and we'll see them contributing to open source in general. And that's why I think we're going to continue to see the demand here. And that's my speech. Um, so I've saved 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers before all the audience leaves. <coughs> yeah, please. Yep. Uh, and that was a driver for the open source. So mm. What was the driver for them of the piracy? Uh, well, for China, they publicly stated it was their entry to the World Trade Organization, and that part of the criteria for entry that they had to um, you know, address uh, software piracy. Yep. So it's a legal legal issue for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just for context. Mm. Hi. Uh, just for context, what are certain what are Red Hat act activities that happen outside of Brisbane? Um, with re in sort of what country were you like an example oh, of? Just, uh, just in general, not familiar with all the aspects that go on with Red Hat. Yep. Uh, it looks like a lot's done in Brisbane. I'm just oh, to gain perspective? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, what we found, I mentioned China earlier. So in, for China, we found that we can get very good hard skills. So um, HTC have been shipping Linux handsets since Trolltech, another great Brisbane company. Uh, well, a, a, a division of a great Norwegian company, recently acquired by Nokia. Uh, Trolltech was based here in um, Brisbane. And they did uh, the QT graphics library, which um, uh, KDE and other projects use. Um, we found, and it was widely uh, very, very successful. So kind of Korean started with uh, Linux on embedded devices, got adopted by HTC and a couple of very large 
mobile um, manufacturers in China, and with that they had to start getting the 2.4 kernel running on embedded devices. So we found that we were able to get a lot of developers in China with, who were familiar with small footprints, writing device drivers, getting things upstream. So we do a lot of our hardcore kernel and virtualization testing in China because of that skill set availability. India uh, has got um, uh, 13 official languages. And so as a country, there's a lot of um, people coming through that education system have a lot of understanding of uh, transliteration, difficulties with inputs, you know, rendering, display, those sort of skills. And there are also um, a long history of contributing to standards such as Unicode. So a lot of our standards contributions and development we do out of India and obviously our Indic language localization we do in India. Yeah. Uh, the Czech Republic I mentioned earlier, since the mid-90s there's been some very famous contributors to the Linux kernel and other open source projects. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the universities are already, you know, you don't learn Visual Studio C++ at a university in Bruno, you learn GCC. So it's easy for us to take graduates from that community and get them straight into open source projects. They just get it. And huge amount of work done in the United States. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks.